Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth. Really sorry for all you cowboy fans. Aww. Also, here is Mark Ellis. <laughs> no, we're not. Pretty happy about it, to be honest with you. Go pack. I'm not going to say that, but glad the Cowboys lost. Also, here's Jeremy Johns. <laughs> I'm bringing it back to inform you guys that I had an entire weekend binging Star Trek The Next Generation, and I want to tell you there are four lights. <laughs> <laughs> also, here's Christian Harloff. I just get into Twitter debates about whether or not Han Solo says, I'm nice men. He doesn't. All right, <laughs> there we go. Uh, coming back off, uh, we hope you guys had a good long weekend and stuff like that, but it's time to get back into things. A couple of significant things dropped over the last number of days. Ashley, start us off. Late Friday, Lucasfilm did something it has rarely done before, address a rumor. The studio released an official statement on StarWars.com, shooting down rumored reports that they are planning to digitally resurrect Carrie Fisher in the wake of the actress's untimely death. After reports emerged that Disney and Lucasfilm were negotiating with Fisher's estate for the rights to her digital image, the studio drafted the press release to set the record straight. We don't normally respond to fan or press speculation, but there is a rumor circulating that we would like to address. We want to assure our fans that Lucasfilm has no plans to digitally recreate Carrie Fisher's performance as Princess or General Leia Organa. John, what do you think about Lucasfilm releasing a press release to shoot down a rumor? Well, normally, yeah, Disney doesn't address rumors, even even the most outlandish ones, whatever. But this this one's a little more sensitive. So I appreciate the fact, actually, that Disney would take the time in Lucasfilm to actually address this one. My first reaction was no duh, uh, but for more of a practical reason than any sort of a sentimental one. We've talked about on the show before that the technology's not there. It's just not there yet. Even if Lucasfilm wanted to do a completely digital Leia for episode nine so they could keep the story idea that they had and all that kind of stuff, they couldn't. You can't do it. We lose, we forget sometimes that, but wait a minute. I mean, okay, let's put up a little bit of a spoiler alert, even though the movie's been out forever. And if you haven't seen Rogue One by now, you're, you're not interested in seeing it. But, you know, when we see Princess Leia for a moment there at the end of Rogue One, that's a moment with hardly any movement. Michael Douglas in Ant-Man, very straight lines. Like it, it, It's very, not easy, but it's a lot easier for them to do that than to like create a character that has full motion movement and use that throughout an entire movie. It's just not there yet tech, from a technology point of view. But also I think Lucasfilm knows that the audience, I don't think, is ready. I think we're going to get to a point, probably in the next 12 years, that not only do we see full CG characters in live-action movies uh, from time to time, but probably digitally resurrected characters. I think we'll get to the, the norm, and I think that will become a normal thing at some point, normal being a couple times a year, not like every single week. But I think Lucasfilm knows like this particular one would be really sensitive and it's not quite time for that yet. So I think there's, there is a sentimental reason, but I think more than anything else, there's a practical reason that they couldn't do it in the first place even if they wanted to. Christian, you heard this stuff. Number one, is this something Disney should have actually come out and addressed? And number two, is it the right decision to not pursue it? Well, as far as addressing it, yeah, they had to address it um, because, like you said, it's very different from how they normally, if they're going to address a rumor of whether or not Snoke is Darth Plagueis, they, yeah, they, they keep yeah. it quiet. But this is, not only do they want to show respect to Carrie Fisher and her family, but this does, there's some people that think it brings into the question of morality to their business. So they want to let you know right off the bat, this is kind of, this is the way we're approaching it. Either they could have said, we're going to do it in a classy way, or they're going to say straight out, we're not doing it. But you can't come out and say, we're not doing it, and then do it later on, because that's right. when you get in trouble. So it not, it's not going to happen. As far as, uh, you, you know, should they, could they do it, or the technology-wise, uh, we talked about it a little on Jedi Council. The problem with this technology, even with the stuff with Tarkin, was that you could see the, the, the way it works with, because with humans is like it's got to match up the way that Peter Cushing's mouth moved that the actor had to really study his face and yeah. it, it's very different than Andy Serkis playing Caesar because there's more to the ape and stuff too but this particular it's going to be hard for them it's right I, really hard for them because from what we hear Leia was going to have a bigger role in episode nine yeah that's what we're hearing so the question is now going to be one of two things 
in between eight and nine, does Princess Leia, uh, you know, meet her untimely demise, or do, or is it? Do they recast? Um, I actually, even though it's harder to do, I, I I weigh on the side of recasting if it's that important for the Kylo Ren arc and the Luke arc. Mark, what do you think? I mean, it's it's still tough to talk about this because really we're just talking yeah. about Princess Leia being in a movie or not, even though it's been over three weeks since Carrie Fisher actually did pass away. But I think that this is a smart statement for Lucasfilm to do because it shows that they're listening to the fans. And this, this is a conversation, like Christian said, where it's not about a rumor whether a character is related to somebody else. This is actually dealing with somebody and an actress that has been so important to the Star Wars franchise that they wanted to get it out there. It still seems to me like there's a 5% chance they could go back on this because they said right now we have no plans to do that which is pretty firm but it's not ironclad now the reason why they're not going to go ahead with this at this point is just merely speculation now is it because the estate wasn't totally comfortable with doing that is it because they don't feel like the technology is ready to do it or is it because they met with Colin Trevorrow and he said look I think we have a way out to take episode 9 in a different direction we don't know, but I'm glad that Lucasfilm and Disney was on top of this and didn't let this chirping continue right. of us just being like, well, we don't know, should we know? I think they wanted to end this discussion right now, yeah. and they did it in a very good way. Yeah, because we're, we're, if it's stuff like Snoke, if it's stuff like who's raised parents, they want us chirping about that. They want everybody talking. This was different, and, I, and you're right. I'm so glad that they said, no, 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 guys, look, let's just, this is not one for us to chirp about. Mm -hmm. You know, the Carrie Fisher passing is not one for us to chirp about. Let's just put this to an end. You're right. I think that's a really great point. What do you think, Jeremy? Yeah, because uh, there are things to, uh, to theorize about, and if they want us to theorize about it, like, they're like, don't bog your brain down with this right here. You know, have fun with these rumors. This isn't even a rumor. This isn't even reality. They had to address it. I'm glad they addressed it. They had to because it's, it's not like we're – not coming off of a Star Wars movie with CGI characters. Like, if that didn't happen and people were like, oh, they might CGI, or they probably wouldn't have addressed it. They're like, it's not even in the realm of reality. But they were like, well, one month ago, okay. So we do have to address this. Um, I'm with you, Christian. I, I go on the side of recasting. As much as it's, it's like a thing that you never thought you would ever say recast Princess Leia, the fact is they set up a story. They set up a good parental story between uh, Princess Leia and uh, Ben Solo, where to go from there, you can't just write her off. There are two things I don't want them to do. Don't CGI Leia and don't kill her off before the movie. You know, it's like she has to have that part in episode nine. So I do go the Dumbledore route where Richard Harris passed away. They recast Dumbledore. It worked. Uh, it's not a role that Richard Harris had for about three or four decades, but, you know, it still works. So it is still possible. And if whoever they might get makes it their own, I think people will be fine with it. Yeah, you know, I'm really glad you brought up the issue, Christian, about about recasting, which is is something I think <clears throat> nobody, because Mark, you're, we're only three weeks, three, three and a half weeks out. Nobody's really wanted to talk about the mm -hmm. issue of recasting. Understand, I haven't wanted to talk about it. But if you're looking at episode nine, and like, you know me, normally I'm like, Look, the, the story trumps anything else. Like you, you do, if you got to recast, you recast. That's how I normally feel. I got to admit, this one's a little more close to home for me. So the idea of somebody else playing Princess Leia does make me go, eh, like, like a little bit. But, you know, when I think about it more, damn, when you look at what Carrie Fisher, forget the fact that she was Princess Leia for all those decades, you know, the original trilogy, all that kind of stuff. When you watch some stuff about what Carrie Fisher did to bring Princess Leia back for The Force Awakens, the amount of work she put in and the amount of effort and the self-torture mm -hmm. and all the things she did to be Princess Leia again so we could have Princess Leia back in the Star Wars universe again, I have a hard time believing that Carrie Fisher wouldn't want the character of Princess Leia to continue. When you, when you look at how much she put into that to, for it to come back to us, and I think you're right, if it comes down to, and this is going to open up a whole new discussion and debate, because I'm sure there's a lot of diehard Star Wars fans who are going to be very, very hardcore, you do not recast Princess Leia. I think there's going to be some diehard devoted Star Wars fans that are going to be, Princess Leia has to move on because the story needs Princess Leia. I, I don't know, it's a tough one. Yeah, that's just, and I think that, like Mark said, it's hard to talk about right now because it's only been about three weeks, but I think the conversations will inevitably start again 
once everyone's seen episode eight, mm-hmm. also because and they'll be well into production by the time episode eight comes out. Yeah, and and Lucasfilm and Colin Trevorrow obviously know what is happening in episode eight, and that's why I think the conversations have been going that route. Of what do we do here? Because by the end of episode eight, we're all gonna say probably what they're saying now is like, well, what are they gonna do? Right. Because they probably set up so many arcs there. But I think that Star Wars fans will actually be forgiving because they'll understand. Yeah. After they see the movie, like. What would they do? Because they've set, and and we could all be speculating over nothing. There could be maybe the, the the angles don't go this way. But if they do, and you're looking, you're going, well, what are they going to do? We kind of need to see how this is going to wrap up. And like you said, Carrie Fisher would want to see how it would wrap yeah, up. Yeah, I so, think so. Yeah, it's a tough one. Jerry makes a great point too, where it's like if this is the arc that you're that, that you want to go on, that you need to have Kylo Ren and Leia either have a reconcile, or I would prefer she just stabs him with a lightsaber. I think that if you need to see that on screen, <laughs> then that should be the route that we eventually go. But as a, as a fan of Princess Leia, it is still impossible for me right now, on this day, on January 17th or whatever it is, to say, I want to see that. Because right. I don't. I don't right. want to see it right now. Right. I do. N- this is not Omar Epps being Willie Mays Hayes in Major League right. 2. You know, This is something that is really, really And tough. that was devastating. It was, yeah. in its own weird way. I wanted to see Wesley Snipes back. He was yeah. great in Major League. I just don't want to see it right now. I, I could be won over. I could I could acknowledge that, oh, yeah, you know what? It is what Carrie Fisher would want. It's it's the right way to to say goodbye to pr- the character Princess Leia. It's just not something I want right now. Yeah, it's uh, it, this is all down to accepting the reality of a situation. It's like two scenarios. Either they recast her or Leia's not in Episode Nine. And if they built it to be, for her to be in Episode Nine. She needs to be in episode nine. So it's just, it's either this or that, and I'd rather the recast. And, you know, a lot of people are still kind of comparing it, and completely understandably why, comparing it to to the Paul Walker situation. Now, the one advantage that the people at Lucasfilm had over the people at Universal when their tragedy happened was that in Paul Walker's circumstances, they were in the middle of shooting that film. So it created a a number of different problems. The one slight... um, better position that Luke's filming is is that episode eight was done filming it's it's shot they had not started shooting episode nine so they had a little they have a little bit more built-in breathing room to try to assess and what do we do at the same time like Jeremy's pointing out Lucasfilm's hands might be a little bit more tied because when we see episode eight like if it ends like Empire Strikes Back with Luke and Leia looking out and saying okay we'll get Han back you can't suddenly now not go get Han back in Return of the Jedi so it, 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 it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out. Answers will come, I'm sure, once we get a chance to see Episode 8. All right, what's next? Hugh Jackman took to Twitter to share the first official synopsis for Logan. Loosely based on the Old Man Logan story arc from the Marvel Comics line, Jackman has said that this will be his last time in the claws unless Ryan Reynolds gets his way and talks him into a Wolverine Deadpool spinoff. <laughs> but for now, the new synopsis sets the stage for the last time we'll see the Canadian mutant in action. In the near future, a weary Logan cares for an ailing Professor X in a hideout on the Mexican border. But Logan's attempts to hide from the world and his legacy are upended when a young mutant arrives, being pursued by dark forces. Jeremy, what do you think about the official synopsis for Logan? Um, I'm, I, nothing, sorry, that did nothing to sway me away from Logan. I can certainly tell you that. Like, Logan's one of the, one of my most anticipated movies of 2017, and that synopsis is why. Poor Logan, man. Like, this guy in the Wolverine is trying to hide out in the woods. He's like, that didn't work. All right, I'll hide out near the border. That's not working. Trouble finds this guy. He's a magnet for trouble. Um, but I love the synopsis of this little young mutant who is probably, uh, X-23, and she comes to him and he's like, oh, I have to I have to protect her. So he finds something to fight for again. And I love the fact that Patrick Stewart's in it. Uh, and I love the possibility, the very slim possibility of Deadpool and Wolverine crossing over with Hugh Jackman. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, for me, I, I reading this synopsis, like that's everything I yeah. got from the trailer. Uh, it's, uh, and, and it adds to that little story that it looks like an independent film, and it reminds me of Hella, Hella Highwater already with everything yeah. going on with it. Even though that in that picture in the background there, he looks like Stephen Lang. Um, but um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I love the synopsis. It's exactly what I thought 
the movie was going to be about from seeing the trailer. I'm happy to hear that the trailer wasn't misleading and it was something ridiculously <laughs> different. So, yeah, I, I liked everything I heard about it. Can you imagine that? After Logan wakes up from VR, right. <laughs> everything right. in the trailer right. was just not reality. What do you think, Mark? Oh, I love this. I mean, it sounds like a Western. It, it, it sounds like exactly how a character should go out where it's like that one last stand. Remember Schwarzenegger's bad movie? It wasn't bad. It was The Last Stand or whatever it was yeah. where it's like right on the border. It was a good movie. Go I watch really it. liked that movie, Nobody actually. else saw Nobody it. Nobody saw it. Saw it. It was one to come back opening to. weekend. It, it, it was his first one back. It wasn't the best, you know. Yeah, yeah, I still got my fastball proof. But this really is exactly what we thought we would get from the Logan trailer. When you talk about Dark Forces coming in, whether that's, you know, uh, Boyd Holbrook or is, is that, is that going to be Pierce? That's going to be Stephen Merchant's character. There's a lot of things that are going to be coming after Logan. For years of pent up looking for this guy, finally finding where he is. He's taking care of an alien Professor X, which is somebody else a lot of people will, be ha will have been looking for. This is all culminating into a great movie that there is no way the Deadpool should be in ever. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm not saying in this movie. I'm saying down the Get road. Get him out of there, Jeremy. Oh, stop it. The stop only it. thing that this uh, <laughs> synopsis does for me is a corrected one line of thinking. In watching the trailer, the one minor detail that I kind of thought might be the case was that maybe Charles brought the girl to him uh, and he was in rough shape. So hearing that, actually, no, we're going to start this story with Logan and Charles still together after all these years. Uh, and he's carrying for him. So that's interesting. So how... X-23 is going to come across Logan. Now I'm wondering how that actually happens. What brings her across his That's path That's Professor that X using his mind, using that Jedi <laughs> mind trick. Like, hey, you should probably come to, you know, Encinitas or wherever the hell we are right now so you can be trained by this older mutant. Looks like they're in Barstow. But anyway, all right, what's next? After the long holiday weekend, it's time for the weekend box office report brought to you by AMC Theaters. Fox's Hidden Figures took the number one spot for a second weekend in a row, pulling in $26 million over four days. Singh held on for the number two spot, earning $19.2 million, with a total domestic gross of $238.4 million. At number three is Lionsgate's Oscar frontrunner, La La Land. The movie made $17.5 million over the holiday period, with a domestic total of 77 million and more than 132 million globally. In the number four spot was Rogue One, which added 17.1 million to its 502.2 million domestic total. It is now the top grossing domestic release of 2016. And rounding out the top five was The Bye Bye Man. The low budget horror earned 15.3 million, well above projections, which had it opening at 10 million. Mark, thoughts on the box office numbers after the long weekend? Ashley, you know, I don't generally root against movies being number one at the box office. Office, and thank God Monster Trucks did not crack Aww. the top five because it was Martin Luther King weekend. It's the day when we celebrate his birthday, his legacy. So I cannot think of a better movie to be number one and a convincing number one than Hidden Figures. It's a really good film. Y'all should go check it out. And Rogue One, if it has to take a step back, La La Land has to take a step back. They did so to the right movie. Uh, the other thing I'll point out is that Bye Bye Man actually did better than I thought it would. That movie cost $6 million to make and it's already made double its, its, its budget. So it's not a great movie, but this is the, it's not a Blumhouse film, but it's that Blumhouse model of we're going to make these horror movies for dirt cheap. They have a cool premise. Whether it's actually a good movie, don't worry about it. Just go see it opening <laughs> weekend. I think Hidden Figures, though, I think that's going to have some legs for a couple weeks. Jeremy. Yeah, I uh, when I saw Bye Bye Man, I was like, this is the kind of uh, this is the kind of movie that costs six million bucks to make. It's gonna double its budget opening weekend. You crept into the top five, Bye Bye Man. Congratulations! But I'm with Mark on this one. I'm glad Hidden Figures was number one. I thought Hidden Figures was a it, it was a very endearing movie. I'm glad La La Land sticking in there. I'm actually impressed with Sing. Like I didn't yeah. think Sing Me would too. be hanging on for yeah. this long, mm -hmm. but it is that high up on Only the list. Only a 33 percent drop. Yeah, from the did, I mean. This, week. I mean Sing of all movies, uh, let's, uh, Rogue One. I'm, I mean, I'm always not, glad to see a Star Wars movie. How, how much is that movie made now? I think Rogue One. Uh, so Rogue One is just right? under 500, just right? Under 500 As a, yeah, it, it probably actually broke it because of Monday. <laughs> no, it's, it's yeah. as, domestically it's at 502 million. Worldwide it is at 983 wow. million. Oh, so yeah. it will, it will, it it will crack the billion dollar. Disney's like, thank you, world. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I, I'm glad Hidden Figures is number one, and I'm bummed out that uh, Bye Bye Man even crept into the top. Five. Uh, Sleepless being as low as it was. Sleepless was a better movie than Bye Bye Man, so it should have been in there. But those horror movies, man, this is why th this is why they make garbage horror movies because people watch them, and if you don't want them to be made, don't go see them. 
But here we are. Christian. Uh, the stupid by my man. It, it, the thing with that movie is that, from and I, I avoided this one on purpose because I said to Schnepp, I'm like, nah, this one might be all right. I'm like, there's no way. Yeah. From, the, from the release and everything pointing to this stink pile. And Mark, who's usually a little more forgiving on it, comes back like he had just been in the trash compactor for the last like six hours. I liked some things about the movie. Doug but, Jones is really good as a bye-bye man. Yeah, you see? Um, <laughs> so the that the was a stretch. The fact that this thing made 15 points, this, this is why when I get a chance to see good horror, like whether it's Don't Breathe or You're going to see one tonight. You're going to see I one am, tonight. Right, right. When I'm split. Well, when it goes to see, like, those types of movies, I wish were made more. But it makes mm -hmm. sense why they make these piles, because it makes nothing. But the fact that this made a profit. Uh, then we get to Hidden Figures, obviously, which I'm so glad. Was, both Hidden Figures and Sing, positioning is the key to both of these movies. Because with, with Hidden Figures, opening when it did, the Oscar buzz uh, that, it, that it's getting, the Golden Globe nominations for sure, and the importance of the movie on the holiday for Martin Luther King, there, there, there is no better movie that could have opened and done as well uh, that everyone should have seen this weekend than Hidden Figures. Sing, positioning is the, is the biggest thing. Because to answer your question, I, I'm not as surprised because nothing else out there. Yeah, and on a holiday weekend when all the kids have off from school, my daughter alone the other day was like, I want to see another I want to see a movie in the theater and my wife and I were, what what's out there right now and I was looking out and she's just sing. We've seen that already. <laughs> but that's probably what a lot of people did. Like they take their kids to the movies yesterday or Sunday and they went and saw Sing. La La Land we knew was going to continue to do well because of all the the Golden Globe stuff, the Oscars. It it is it happens every year. The one with the big buzz, they released it in wide release and it was crushing when it was in limited release. So yeah. and it's a great movie. So there you go. Uh, it should be pointed out that the numbers that we've got here on the screen are reflective of the Monday as well mm -hmm. as the holiday. On the pure weekend, it was a little bit of a different order if you just counted the, mm -hmm. the Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday. And number one was still Hidden Figures, but La La Land was actually number two mm -hmm. over just the weekend. Sing was number three. Obviously, that holiday Monday, yeah. a lot of parents want to take their kids to see Sing, so that jumped up number two there. Bye Bye Man was number four. And Rogue Gross. One, a rogue story, was in number five. So it's just interesting to see that. Yeah, here's the funny, the thing about Bye Bye Man, and it's, it's, a, it's a terrible movie. It is a terrible <sighs> movie. But you got to understand, I think I know why a lot of people would run out and see it. L look what just happened in 2016. A couple of very low-budget, premise-based horror movies, Lights Out, Don't Breathe. And they were great. I had such a good time watching both of those. So even though I did not like the trailer, I think a lot of people are probably in the same boat as me. Didn't like the trailer to Bye Bye Man, but I'm just coming off of watching a bunch of really good low-budget horror movies, so yeah, let's go. The difference with that, though, and this is what I think certain people are doing this, and um, uh, oh my God, I can't, uh, James Wan certainly did it. It's taking not high-priced talent, but good talent. And someone yeah. like Stephen Lang, putting Stephen Lang, and the kids were in, in Don't Breathe were really good actors. From what I hear, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of the actors in Bye Bye Man, not so good. You're not wrong. No, it, no, it, 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 Christian, it, it honestly, never been more right. <laughs> right. it honestly was, it, it, I think you might have said this to me, I can't remember coming out of it, or it might have been somebody else saying, that felt, no, it was you. <laughs> you said, um, that felt like a college film student project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. With, not even college <laughs> film student actors. They just went out and got their buddies to try to act in it. I usually don't like to talk disparagingly about yeah. actors themselves, but they, they were pretty bad. Yeah. Doug, was Jones really bad. Doug Jones was good as the Bye Bye Man. Doug Jones was good as the Bye Bye Man. Yes. Good. It was the funniest thing is we're, we're, we're going back, we're carpooling, and there's this big billboard of Assassin's Creed and Fast Men just like this. It's like, look at him. He's like, how you like me now? <laughs> That's exactly what he said in the car. It's like uh, Fast Men. like, look at that I don't look so bad now, do I? <laughs> it was hysterical. All right, guys, we reached out part of the show now for, uh, I was going to say mailbag, but that would be wrong. It's time for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Ashley's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And those at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what's up? During the recent TCA presentation of 2017, Tom Hardy was answering questions about his new FX series, Taboo, when the conversation turned to his work in Mad Max Fury Road. After the panel, Hardy spoke to Collider's Christina Radish, where he commented that there's much more to explore in the mythology of the Mad Max franchise, and then confirmed that Mad Max Wasteland is still happening. Yeah, as far as I've signed to do three of them. It's a question of when. I'm not sure it's called The Wasteland or not, because you never know. These titles change all the time. But there's definitely another Mad Max project pending. Christian, based on Hardy's comments about the next Mad Max movie, do you buy or sell the movie heading into production this year? This year? 
man, I'm gonna. Uh, that's a tough one. I'm gonna go ahead. I'm gonna sell this year. I'm gonna sell this year. I'm gonna buy that it's gonna go into production for sure. But that I don't think because that that would mean to have to if they went into production like October. I don't think it's going out in summer. But it, October that means it's coming out next year. I think it's a summer release, so I think it'll probably go into production next year. But it's inevitable that the movie's gonna be made. I it's it, the last one was great, arguably the best one out of all of them. So yeah, it'll be made. I just don't think it's gonna be production this year. Mark, I buy that they're going to make an official announcement that it's going into production, but it will not happen this year. I think the announcement comes out this year, like in, you know, so October cheating. of 2017. I am not cheating. I am saying an official announcement is going to happen this year, but it's not going to go into production until 2018. So you're selling it. I am buying that there's going to be an official <laughs> announcement about production this year. It's not the question. But it will not go into production this right. year. I am buying <laughs> that there's an official announcement. Dodging the Jeremy. I, I'm going to be a little more straightforward about it. I, I, will it go into production this year? No, I'm going to sell that premise. It makes me laugh that this is even a thing where it's like, I mean, he's like, I mean, we're trying. It, it's like Dread or something. What is this, Dread? Is it trying to get Dread 2 made? I understand why that's having a little bit of problems, although it shouldn't. But Mad Max Fury Road was uh, well-received by critics, well-received by moviegoers at box office. It's an Oscar-nominated film, for God's sakes. Like, why is this even an issue? But uh, this this year, no, but we will get Mad Max 2, 3, 5, 4. We'll get the next one. I, th I think there's an issue here that everybody's dancing around. The fact of the matter is a, a lot of us think, we just assume, Mad Max Fury Road made tons of money. It did, didn't it? It didn't. Yeah. Worldwide, oh, right yeah, worldwide, the movie, right. I mean, it made $154 million domestically, which is pretty good. Add another 220 it made $378 million worldwide. But it was on a $150 million budget. By the time you take 33%, off of that worldwide total for the, the cut that the sh uh, theaters actually keep, then you put on top of that $150 million budget all the marketing and the P&A, you're looking at a film that more than broke even and even made a little bit of money, but did not make the money they were anticipating. However, uh, it also got Oscar buzz. And when a film gets, that, like, gets Oscar buzz, it gives them a little bit more of, well, it didn't do that much, but everyone was talking about it. Everyone was talking about Warner Brothers because our movie was up there. George Miller was out there. And that, that sometimes can make the push into making another movie because the last one had a war. No, it absolutely can. I'm just saying this idea that another Mad Max movie is an absolute lock, I think is a fairy tale. Now, do I believe another Mad Max movie will happen? Yes, if I had to put 100 bucks on it, I would say yes. But listen closely to Tom Hardy's own words. He doesn't say, yep, we're, we're firing up. No, no, no. He said, another Mad Max one is pending. Pending, I think, is the word that is like, guess what? There's another Star Trek movie pending. There's another uh, Aragon, the movie about the dragons. There's still one pending. I mean, I, I really... Hearing Tom Hardy's statement and the way he worded it, it doesn't give me, honestly, any more or any less hope that one's about to come. I still think it's a chance. I would still put money on this coming. This year, though, I think 0% chance. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell that we're going to see one going to production this year, absolutely. Okay, I, I was just going to start to like, okay, would you bet 1000 bucks that it's happening? <laughs> nope. <laughs> think of it this way. Nope. I know that's, that's a good question. I would put 100 bucks down this yeah. can happen. But I don't feel confident enough that I would put a thousand. So you have a gambling problem, not an addiction. <laughs> yeah. so, so, so at that point, it's all about time. Now, keep in mind, for the last Mad Max, it may take two and a half decades, but we'll get another Mad Max movie. Yeah, yeah, I think we're eventually. I think we're going to eventually get there. But I wouldn't. I wouldn't bet the farm on it though. At this point, it's a lock. All right, what's next? One of the more troubled projects in Fox's Marvel universe is Gambit. The X Men spinoff is currently without a director or a release date, but it does still have a star. Speaking with reporters at the recent TCA's presentations over the weekend, X-Men producer Lauren Schuler Donner confirmed that Channing Tatum is still attached to play the Raging Cajun, though no other details were provided. John, based on these comments, do you buy or sell Channing Tatum's Gambit movie ever happening? Uh, I think there's a better chance we're going to get a Mad Max going into production this year <laughs> than we're actually going to see Channing Tatum playing Gambit. Look, I am one, I, I'm one of the guys that when the name Channing Tatum came out for Gambit, I was like, oh, come wait a minute no wait that could actually work when you i think and i think a lot of people i think a lot of you guys are the same way as me first reaction Channing Tatum is gambit and then we thought about it, it was like you know what that could work and i i still believe it could have worked 
At this point, though, with all the drama, the coming and going of the directors, all the drama between Channing Tatum himself and the studio, and all the, the, the production dates canceled, release dates canceled, all that kind of stuff, I just don't see how this works, especially when Fox puts out a little $50 million R-rated comic book film that pulls in $700 million worldwide in Deadpool, and then they turn to Channing Tatum, um, why should we give? Because I remember the reported budget at first was around 200 million. Ridiculous. Then that went, you damn right. And then they reduced it down to about, I think, 150. And I think Fox went to Channing and they come, why should we give you 150 to 200 million dollars to make this film when clearly we don't have to? Um, I think that brought a lot, because I think a lot of us anticipated, I think a lot of our viewers as well anticipated that if they did a gambit, it would kind of have, obviously would not be Deadpool, but it would kind of be in the same flavor of Deadpool a little bit. And obviously they don't need, I just don't see how this is going to happen. I sell that this is going to happen with Channing Tatum. I'm going to buy it and I'll tell you why. Really? Uh, but here's why. Here's why. Because I'm, I'm going to have a little bit of faith that Fox is going to take this route with it. If they don't, then it's never going to happen. If they put Gambit in a Deadpool movie, if they put him in a Deadpool film, and they get fans to enjoy that character because as a standalone movie, first of all, for 150, 200 million, you're out of your minds. But if you put in, if you put him in there, and because once again, Deadpool getting this potential Oscar buzz, it's already has a lot of award considerations. More talent is going to want to be involved with the second one. Now, Gambit is already locked in as a contract. Excuse me, Shannon Tatum locked into playing Gambit. If they put him in Deadpool 2 or put him in something with Deadpool and Wolverine and get the fans to go, wait a minute, that guy, I want to see a movie with him. Then it's possible. And I think that they're going to have plans to put him in the movie to try to get it done because they really want this game. The Donners really want this movie to happen. Uh, they've been wanting this movie to happen for a very long time and they are just driven to get it done. So that's why, oh so slightly, if they follow the Deadpool path and use that as a catapult, as a standalone all by itself, I would sell it. You know why that's not going to happen? I'll tell you why that's not going to happen. There is no way. There was a little movie called Blade Trinity a while ago. I think some, yeah, that's some of you may remember. Basically, they just used the movie to try to put over these new characters that they called the Night Stalkers, which was Ryan Reynolds mm -hmm. as a Hannibal Kane and uh, Jessica Biel, right? Miss, yeah, Mrs. Yeah. Timberlake yeah. as uh, wielding some kind of lightsaber bow and arrow, which was a really odd choice. And it destroyed that movie, trying to use Blade uh, just as a as a vehicle to put, put over another thing. I don't think there is any way that Ryan Reynolds allows the Deadpool movie to be used as just a vehicle to put another. No, character no, no. But over. I, I'm not saying just another. Just that's the only reason why. Colossus. He's got He's got to fit the story. And the difference with those guys is that Gambit is part of this universe he works in this universe so they could fit a way that it makes sense for the story i agree he's not gonna go come on in put him in if if ryan reynolds f thinks that it makes sense to use it then it's possible what do you think yeah they used colossus so i, I right. they, they could use another x but not 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 in the hopes of launching a colossus no, movie. no not in the hopes of launching a colossus movie i do think it is in the hopes somehow some way shape or form of a next step after this current X-Men franchise goes away. I think it'll I think it was them dipping their toe in water of sorts. But uh will it All right, so Channing Tatum as uh, as Gambit. Will it happen? I'm with you. When I heard he was Gambit, I was like, "Oh, it, uh, yeah, like didn't didn't he grow up in Cajun country? Like he's got the <laughs> roots, you know?" So, I mean, yeah, I, I feel like he could do it. He has good comedic timing. Will it happen? No, I'm going to sell that it happens, but I do like Christian's take on it as to how they could do it, how they could get it done. I think that's fascinating, uh, but whether or not it will happen is another question. I see a lot of potential of uh, them expanding their universe and getting more X-Men because if you look at it, they're losing Wolverine now. Right. Like they, that, That's yeah. one thing they do have that they no longer have. So like, what do we fill the gap with? And that's a good question. Well, they're using Hugh Jackman as Wolverine. Don't yeah, be surprised yeah. if they recast him. Well, yeah. Well, yeah, it recast them in a new X-Men universe yeah. with Gambit and Colossus right. and all them. Um, so that I mean, kind of is more to the point. Uh, sell that it'll happen, but if it does, I'll be pleasantly surprised. What do you think else? Here's how hard I sell this. Channing Tatum is Gambit. If that happens, I will go to Orlando and wrestle that alligator that they just found that's like 15 <laughs> feet long. This is not going to happen. The only hardcore piece of evidence that we have that Channing Tatum is going to be playing Gambit in public is when he came on stage at Comic-Con and took a selfie with a bunch of other famous people. Nothing else has indicated that he actually wants to do this, that he's going to do this, that he even still has a contract. And this is a good reporter doing their job, asking a follow-up question, and the exact answer 
that this reporter got was at this point, yes. At this point, yes, is not a ringing endorsement mm -hmm. that, oh, we can't wait to light the fireworks. There's a Gambit movie coming out. Then they asked if Channing Tatum, what, what is he doing to prepare for the role? And Schuller Donner said, you'll have to ask Channing Tatum. It's like, that is not saying that we want this movie to happen, that we even think this could be a possibility. That's just simply saying, oh, I can't say what I really feel like because there's some sort of contract stipulation. Whenever that contract runs out, it's going to be public knowledge that I cannot imagine Channing Tatum is still wanting to play Gambit. Maybe he's locked into a contract in the meantime i do not think that we ever see a channing tatum gambit movie all right i i'm i am curious i want to throw this over to the communications table if you will i want to hear from ashley and wendy Ashley, hey, let's start with corner, you are, are okay number one are we going to see channing tatum as gambit and number two as a film fan do you care to see channing tatum at this point as gambit I mean, I think that he seems enthusiastic to play a, a, a character in the comic book world, but I don't think this is going to work. There's just been too many issues with the whole production. I don't think it's going to happen at this point. Wendy? At this point, I'm losing patience. I was starting to just get on board with him as Gambit, and at this point now, he's my favorite X-Men character, Gambit. Oh, really? Yeah. Next to Wolverine. Let's not forget. But... I never was that like into Channing Tatum playing him, but I like Channing Tatum, so I was kind of like, all right, I could, I, I could convince myself to go and be excited for this movie, and then there's just issue after issue, and then he yeah. came out. Do you remember? It was a 2014 Comic Con Hall H, like he like just took the came selfie and just came on, and then it was like, oh, we have Channing Tatum here, and that's it. And I was like, so you, what is this? Like, it, it was <laughs> the presentation was kind of a mess for the, for that specific title, and then. The whole production and everything, it just seems like a mess. And I, at this point, I don't want to see it. I think they need to start over. I don't know if any of you guys saw. You know how they're doing a Magic Mike uh, stage show? Yeah. And did you see the promotional video that Channing Tatum put out for that? No. It, it <laughs> is... Oh, seriously, look up this video. It's Channing Tatum. It's like, he goes... Hey, ladies. And he's walking through. The, the, he pretends in this video that he just lives in a house with all these super buff male models that do everything in the house, like, topless, whether it's cooking breakfast or doing things out by the pool. It is really funny. Channing Tatum's turned it into actually one of my favorite personalities in the business. Ask was that a commission. I am like, why not for this story? I will yeah. be looking up that video. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, but I just don't see it happening. All right, Ashley. All right. Close the YouTube window for a second. I'm going to try. What's okay, the next okay. story? Variety reports that Gugu Mbatha-Ra will star in the superhero thriller Fast Color for La La Land producer Jordan Horowitz. Mbatha-Ra will portray a woman forced to go on the run when her superhuman abilities are discovered. Miss Stevens director Julia Hart is on board to helm from a screenplay she wrote with producer Horowitz. Principal photography on Fast Color will commence in New Mexico on March 13th with a release date yet to be determined. Mark Byers tells the superhero thriller Fast Color starring Gugu Mbatha-Ra. Here's how much I'm buying this, Ashley. I want to see this movie so bad, I would sit next to the gator from Florida <laughs> to watch this movie. I love these kind of films where it's taking a comic booky premise, a superhero premise, but you're not tied down to a bigger world like DC or Marvel. It's the same thing we saw with Jeff Nichols' Midnight Special last year where, hey, we, we have the freedom to tell whatever kind of story we want. We don't have to have a whole lot of action. We can have more emotional depth to this thing. That's what it appears to be from here. And Gugu Mbatu, we're also a rising star. She was in Miss Sloan. Next year, she's going to be in Beauty and the Beast, the God Particle, A Wrinkle in Time. She is somebody to keep your eye on. And in a story like this, where you can have more, more diversity, you can have strong women in superhero movies, this is what we want to see. And if DC and Marvel ain't giving it to us, make your own movie. That's exactly what's happening here. And I'm so on board with this thing. The Gator is too. Christian. Uh, I'm going to buy it also for a lot of the reasons Mark's saying here, because I think that this proves more than anything that when people say, is the super is the superhero genre going to die out soon? It is a genre now. It is a genre, and these are the types of movies that are going to prove that. Not just Marvel and DC. When you have movies like this, when you have movies like Kick Ass and movies like just different movies, like you said, Midnight Special, it's new. It's fresh. It's not. Just, it gives you another chance. And it also going back to what we were saying with Logan where Logan obviously is the big budget movie, but it shifts gears as far as the, the big spectacle movies. And I want more movies to do that. And this movie seems like it's gonna do that also. But because of Gugu Mubatu Ra, I was, I'm just now finally pronouncing the name right, hopefully. Um, she, uh, she is great. And everything that she's going to be doing as of right now, I'm going to be buying because she is one of those talents. At one point she was rumored for the Han Solo movie. Her name is being thrown out 
everywhere. So for her to get something like this, I think it also sh her talents will shine. So yeah, big buy. The reason I buy this is because it's a trend that I want to see really start flowing in Hollywood, which is the idea of Hollywood trying to create original superhero movies not based on comic book properties per se, or at least ones that everybody really knows. Look, there was a little one that Chris Evans put out a while ago called Push, which I didn't think was, I thought it was a clever little movie that you'd think was a comic book superhero movie where they talk about something like Chronicle or where they talk about something like this. This sounds interesting to me, so for me it's a buy. Yeah, for, for all the same reasons. It's like we, we had our independent, not independent, but our standalone superhero movies for a while, and then we saw, ooh, a cinematic universe, oh, that's really cool, now everyone's doing that, now the pendulum wants to swing back and go, hey, all right, we kind of want the ones that aren't attached to a whole living, breathing, multiverse world anymore. And there are some gems in the lesser known comic books that now that superhero uh, comic book movies are so huge and so big, it's almost like studios are willing to humor making those into movies, which is actually a really, really, really cool thing. You go to that, you go past the DC, past the Marvel bin, you go to your comic book store in the back, there's some really cool comic books you never even heard of. I'm glad that Hollywood's gonna take a chance on some of those too, so yeah, for sure, bye. All right, guys, so listen, I want to remind you that Movie Talk is not the only show dropping on Collider Video today. As a matter of fact, yesterday, a brand new episode of TV Talk went up. Today, a brand new episode of Heroes goes up. Make sure you check that out. This weekend, our newest Crash Course went up, with hosted by John Schnepp, on everything we know about Justice League so far. That's on the front page of our YouTube channel right now. Make sure you check that out. And of course, keep following Collider Video all day for any breaking news. And I want to remind you too, that as we do this show live, at the end of the show, we're going to save a few minutes to take some of your live Twitter questions. You can start sending those questions in. Just make sure you're following us on Twitter, at Collider Video. Fire in your questions, and Wendy will pick a couple out for us to address at the end. But for now, we're going to go to our mailbag. If you want to get a mailbag question in, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Ashley, what is in the mailbag today? Jason writes, hi, Collider. Great show. My question for you is that if Spider-Man Homecoming does excellent box office over the last Spider-Man movie, will this open the door for Sony to make Spider-Man spin-offs from the Spidey characters they own license rights for? Could we see a Sony Spider-Man cinematic universe that is a niche part of the MCU like Netflix, or would you rather them concentrate only on Teenage Spider-Man like Harry Potter, one Spidey film every one or two years? I think it's absolutely a part of their plan. I think Sony absolutely has it in their plans to make Spider-Man spin-off movies. And I like the way you put it in your email. I say a niche part of the universe, like the Netflix universe, technically is in that mm -hmm. same universe and yet it's completely insulated from it at the same time. I think you're probably going to see Sony in the next coming years do that as well. But I also think Sony's going to take their time with it. They made some major botching mistakes with that last Amazing Spider-Man movie they did. Not the least of which was before even seeing the movie come out and understanding where their footing was, they started announcing, and we're gonna have a Sinister Six movie, and we're gonna do this, and we're gonna do this, and we're gonna do this, and they just made fools of themselves doing it. I think they've learned some lessons from that. I think right now they're gonna, you're not even gonna hear anything about any other Spider-Man spin-off movies until after Spider-Man Homecoming comes out, and at that point I think we'll start hearing some plans. And remember, we heard when the initial deal between Marvel and Sony was made, that part of the deal was that Marvel will be able to use some of those adjunct characters in the Spider-Man universe from time to time, but also that some Marvel characters could show up in their films as well. So I do think they're gonna have grander plans, whether or not they work, we don't know, but I do think they have those grander plans. What do you think? I think the plans are out there, and then I think that the, the Marvel people, uh, Kevin Feige, and I was like, no, stop that. Stop that. You know he has he, he can't do that. You know that, right? I know that he can't <laughs> He I does not actually have the power to do that. No, he is not he doesn't have the power to actually put the squash on it, but he certainly has the power to say it. And I mm -hmm. bet you that they were just like, stop. Let's concentrate on Tom Holland and Peter Parker first. You want to do it down the line? Yeah, 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 sure. Talk, I'm telling you. There's no way that they're gonna do this right away because they haven't Spider Man is one of the most beloved characters, and arguably there are two really good movies. I like the first Amazing Spider-Man, and I think that you did too. A lot of people didn't love it. Second one was not so good. Um, and it, it basically just destroyed everything that they were going to do. And I think that by you have to jumpstart this by putting new characters in this franchise. I think down the line, it's certainly possible, but these movies have to crush because these 
new villains or these new spinoffs are going to be part of the MCU now. That we we all know is is to be is going to be true. So if there are ways that they can maybe even transfer over into some of the other Marvel movies. Maybe I don't. I think it's too big of a risk right now. It depends. I think after the second one, after the the second Tom Holland Spider Man movie, that's when it's more realistic if it's going to happen at all. What do you think? Yeah, I was actually I was going to throw out the wait till the second one before we start seeing. Yeah. It. I think their big problem right now, the biggest thing they're hit with is where do what do we actually pull from? Because there is so much Spider Man lore. There's a lot mm. that's happened. There's a multiverse attached to Spider Man. There's a Spider Verse as they call it. Um, there's more than just Green Goblin and Venom. There's a lot out there. Uh, and what they're going to do, I find that exciting. Are they going to pull from the uh, the Clone Saga that was hit or miss with fans in the 90s? I personally thought it was cool. Um, are they going to pull from uh, like Spider-Girl, which is the Mae Parker, which is Peter Parker's daughter down the line? Are we ever mm -hmm. going to see her in a Marvel film that may or may not show the future? I have no idea. I'm excited for that premise, but I do think all things in their due time. Let's have a good Spider-Man movie. Let's see him interact with the Avengers, like Christian said. Second Spider-Man movie, then you give clues to where they're going, and then we go from there. Let, let's pace it, though. What do you think, Mark? I mean, John, I'm still reeling from the fact that we're never going to get that standalone Paul Giamatti as Rhino movie. That <laughs> we're we're going, Spidey. <laughs> really? It just it would have been so good. Yeah, just make that movie anyway. Although my but pants but fell down. Oh, I, so I, I want to see a standalone Spider-Man universe. I think it's important to see. That's the only way that we're going to get to see the, I, the May movie that John Schnepp and I have been working so hard on the last three years. But even more important than that is that I'm operating on the premise that Spider-Man Homecoming is going to be a great film. Is it we're all going to love is going to bring us back to what we loved about Spider-Man in the first place. And if that is the case, there's so many other characters in the Spider-Man sandbox that aren't necessarily going to be able to be involved in a larger MCU movie. And we don't know what the landscape of the MCU is going to look like after the second Infinity War film. Right, we yes. We don't know if a lot of those characters are going to survive, they're going to move on, if they're going to maybe try a soft reboot of some of those characters. But Spider-Man is a strong enough character to continue on, whether you're telling a story with Venom or Green Goblin, or you want to venture into Carnage, or you want to venture into something else. Hell, you can flip it and do Spider-Gwen. You can do so yeah. many things yeah. mm -hmm. in this universe that I think it makes all the sense in the world for the production studio to be planning a bunch of films coming out right now. Don't put the cart ahead of the horse. Just make sure this is a good film. But as soon as that comes out and that happens, I think you can start to look at this Netflix situation like what you were talking about. Yeah, and I think that's the key. It's, it's Remember, Ike Perlmutter, who is in charge of all the Marvel television stuff, they do whatever they want to do on television, and you know they'll, they'll put up some newspaper clippings on the wall, whatever, but they pretty much try to keep it isolated. The question that I'm going to have is, like, look, if their plan is to make movies that fit in with the overall MCU, like more integrated than the Netflix show, then I think you are absolutely right, 100%. However, if they want to go more the Netflix route and say, we're going to create more isolated stories that while, yes, they are in the same universe, much like Daredevil is, they're going to be more isolated and we're going to go with whether it's a Spider-Gwen or whether it's other side characters. I think that's more realistic. And you're right. I think if they get the first Spider-Man movie out and everybody breathes a sigh of relief and it's good and we realize, okay, we're on good footing... Then a few months after that, you can say, announce some plans for a movie that'll come out a year and a half or two years later. But no, if, if I see your train of thought, because you're right. If they are saying, no, we're gonna make a Miles Morales movie, and it's also gonna fit right in with the MCU, we're gonna try to integrate it more, then you are dead on correct. All right, guys, we're gonna skip over the last mailbag thing because we wanna make sure we have some time for your live Twitter questions for those of you guys who are watching this live. So we're gonna do that right now. Wendy, what have you picked out? The first one comes from Ben S, who writes, Greetings from Ontario, Canada. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you think that some of the backlash generated towards La La Land will affect the Oscars? No. There's really not much backlash against yeah. it at all. Look, I'll go on record right now. La La Land is not the best picture of the year. I, I, I don't think it's the best picture of the year. But it's so good that I have no problem if it wins best picture of the year. If that movie wins best picture of the year, I'll say, you know what? It's so good that I have no problem with it whatsoever. Um, I really, I do think it's going to win Best Picture of the Year. I still don't think it should, but it's a damn good film, and it's got a lot of those. First of all, it's a difficult one to make, and they and they made it, and they made it almost flawlessly. I, I still have a little, a few question marks about not the last act, but maybe like the last five to ten minutes. I thought maybe could have been navigated a little bit better, but other than that, it is a almost flawlessly executed film from start to finish, and really there's not a lot of backlash against it. When the nominees come out on, I believe, January 24th, when they actually get announced, 
you might feel a little more backlash against La La Land because people who, there are going to be a lot of people out there whose favorite films are going to be nominated against La La Land are really going to be making a push. And since La La Land's the lead horse right now, everybody's going to be turning their attacks against La La Land because it's not a, an even race right now. I do think La La Land's going to win the best picture, and I think it's good enough that I don't complain about it. What do you think? I feel the same way. I think that there are, if you saw the movie and you didn't like the movie, uh, then you have every right to not like the movie. If you had your issues with a lot of sure. the movie, then yeah. you had every right to have your issues with the movie. But I also think that that shouldn't sway someone who went and saw the movie and didn't have those issues with it uh, and didn't have the problems with it and enjoyed it and were blown away by the cinematography and everything about the that movie. Um, I thought the chemistry was really good between the two of them. There's a lot lot to love about that film. I think it's one of the best. It personally wasn't my favorite, um, but I, I still see where a lot, on most lists, it's the number one. You look what it did at Golden Globe, it's not going to take, there's been a lot of movies that have one best picture that have had controversy around them, or excuse me, backlash around them, and have still won with no problem whatsoever, and I don't think this is going to be any different. Alice, what do you think? Uh, I think there should be a huge backlash against La La Land because I've never been to a Starbucks on a movie set where the line is that easy to just walk <laughs> in. She literally just walks in and gets a coffee. That line is always wrapped around the block. It's a Warner Brothers lot, though. They just have people deliver to you. It's, but it's the Central Perk. It's impossible. Yeah, that's it's, true. So besides that, look, I, La La Land was my favorite movie of the year. I think the way it was directed is just absolutely brilliant. It, it swept me up in a world of imagination, and I loved every second of watching it. Now, if it didn't win, would I be upset? That depends on what movie does win. I think there's a lot of movies out there that could contend for Best Picture, and I would not throw a big stink, even movies that were not in my top ten. If, if Arrival wins Best Picture of the Year, I'm not going to complain about it because it was such a moving movie. Even though it wasn't in my top ten, I still really liked yeah, it. I'll, 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 com I'll complain. I know you're going to yes. complain. That's why I'm rooting for a rival to win, because I want to see John Campia get upset. So I think this is one of those fun years where there could be 10 movies that get announced, whether it's, yeah. it's Hacksaw Ridge or it's Moonlight or it's Hell or High Water. There's a lot of movies that are worthy winners of the Best Picture Oscar, and it's going to be fun for us to yell and debate and throw popcorn at each other. What do you think, Jeremy? Yeah, you want to see, uh, you want a rival to win, so can't be able to wrestle an alligator in Florida. <laughs> I get it. I get where you're going. Nobody no, else touches my <laughs> Stegosaurus. That's mine. But this is the way I see it. I'm with, I'm with Christian. It's like, hey, if you liked it, that's great. If uh, you didn't, well, that doesn't detract from the people who did like it. The way I see award shows, award shows, awards are given and they're voted on by people who have their taste. Granted, for the Oscars, they're in that field, and that's why they get to vote. But the fact is, if the movie wins Best Picture, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't detract from the fact that you thought it was great and uh, whatever does win best picture it doesn't awards don't like you know the, like it doesn't make I don't it enjoy not movies great unless anymore. they win statues yeah. Jeremy yeah you do you let them do them you know it's funny think, thinking about this I remember in 2016 we were getting into about July and August and every the, the conversation out there was pretty much man disappointing year in film because there were a number of films that came out that had some very high expectations that ended up underwhelming a lot of people and it was that but now you get to the end of the year and yeah. you're right this is a year that 10 could be nominated for best picture mm -hmm. easy this ended up being a pretty damn good year for film when you end up seeing that big list stinky summer great oscar season yeah <laughs> all right let's take two more okay adrian m soto writes by our cell we get trailers or teasers of thor ragnarok justice league and hopefully star wars episode eight in the super bowl mm. um Ooh. as we talked about on yesterday's movie talk i think zero percent chance that we're going to see a Justice League trailer at Super Bowl. Justice League don't come out to November. And remember, they've got another little movie that they need to put some attention on called Wonder Woman coming out before that. So I think you're going to see the majority of the marketing efforts right now, rightfully so, by Warner Brothers and DC, is going to be put on Wonder Woman. A lot is riding on Wonder Woman. Mm -hmm. They need this film to be a big hit. I think you're going to see them put their attention on that. Episode 8... No, I think we would have heard something yeah, by now at this point, so I'm going to say now. But what was the third Thor. one? Ragnarok? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. It's too far away. It's, yeah. I, st I think, but you know what? I, I see, If I had to pick one out of the three that had the best chance of having one air, I would probably say Thor Ragnarok. I'm going to go. I'm going to sell all three from the same logic you're talking about with Thor. Is that they got Guardians to push first? Guardians is yeah. more likely to have that trailer than anything else. I think we'll see Guardians. I don't think you're going to see because every one of those movies comes out in November and December, so it's just too far away. And I think it's a waste of time. And they just announced, by the way, what the price tag is for advertising at the Super Bowl. Four dollars yeah, for one minute. For one minute. 
Does anybody know what, what they're charging this year I'll for say, one uh, minute? Two I'll say four million. I'll say four and a half. Yeah. You're all under. It's five million wow. a minute. Five million a minute this wow. year at the Super Bowl they're charging for those ads. I remember one year, it was the greatest thing ever. It was like half a second long. It was for High Life Beer. This dude literally goes, High Life! And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, the, I'm like great. most brilliant thing I've ever seen in my life. Um, there is a Super Bowl tradition every other year that says we'll get a Transformers trailer on this thing. And for some yeah. odd reason, I think we're going to get huh? a mummy. I, I, for some odd reason, I think Mummy's going to be in there. Right. Universal wants to kick this thing off, right? Yeah. So that's a really good call. And they did, didn't, I think, that last year Universal had a pretty strong uh, right. push that's also. Just... And their movies did pretty good. Yeah. Um, not as well as they did the, the year before, but we'll see. Yeah, I, I don't think you're seeing any of those movies, although uh, prognosticating which movies are going to have trailers during the Super Bowl is one of my favorite pastimes. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I think Guardians, I think Spider-Man, I think Wonder Woman, I think The Tale's Old as Time, um, and I think probably some sort of Transformers thing, too. But it, everybody else on the panel is absolutely correct, is that for every movie that you postulated, there's a film coming out from that same studio before those movies. And with Episode Eight. Disney, when, when it comes to Disney and Lucasfilm, they want to dominate making their trailer announcement. They don't want it to be like, oh, yeah, I like the episode eight. I also like this and this and this. Yeah. They want to be the one on the block, and that's it. And remember, like John just said, it was $5 per minute. $5. $5 million, <laughs> $5 million per minute. Why am I going to do that if I'm Disney putting episode eight or Thor Ragnarok for both of those when I have other movies like Beauty and the Beast to promote mm -hmm. when I also know how strong the internet and how nice the internet is going to be to me when I put an episode right. eight trailer out. I don't need the mm -hmm. Super Bowl and I don't need to spend that money on marketing right now. Especially with it still being like nine months away by yeah. the time it comes yeah. out. When, and, and when I have celebration coming right around the corner. Like there's these things that it's just these other promotional tools that will cost them a lot less and get the word out as strong. Now, for Campia's sake, I want there to be an episode eight trailer because it's going to be tough to watch Aaron Rodgers carve up the Patriots defense like that for four hours. Dude, you're, you're assuming the Patriots get past the Steelers, which I'm Which not, is not an easy task. It's not an easy task. I'm not, I'm not so sure this can happen. All right, last question of the day. Last one comes from Chris Gomez, who writes, do you think that di digital facial rights will be an issue in the future for bringing old characters? I think what's going to happen is you're going to have a small window of time where the the mire that is this new ground of digital imagery is going to get sorted out so it's, there's going to be a small window where it becomes a confusing issue and then it's going to become sorted out it's going to become a part of every actor's contract mm -hmm. just like when the internet was really becoming popular for streaming content they went through that period of mire it's like well what do i get paid for what goes on the internet like that had to all get worked out and i think in the future a standard actor's contract, part of that is going to be your digital likeness rights for things that go on in the future. So there will be a small window of confusion, but then I think they'll get that sorted out, and then it'll just become a part of everyday life, just like internet streaming rights. What do you guys think? But will it, will it be a big issue? Yes. It's going to be an issue for a lot of movies coming out, because what does Hollywood love doing more than anything else? It's using known franchises and brands in a different way going forward. So they're going to want to use the likenesses of people that are no longer around, or or even if they're still alive, but they don't necessarily look like that anymore. So it's going to become a bigger and bigger issue as this technology progresses. Anybody else? It's going to happen for sure. It's going to be an issue. And I think that even when I, I was lucky enough to talk to Andy Serkis a few years back for Dawn of the Planet of the Apes and ask him, like, is it going to ever be possible to see like a young John McClane doing, you know, it, it, just but you see actual Bruce Willis. He said it, it definitely could happen. I think down the line it's going to happen. We've already seen it so far with everything in Rogue One. And they're going to, I think you're absolutely right. I think that people are going to start kind of having to sign those type of things yeah. right off the bat. It'll be part of the contract for in 20, 30 years if they want to use it or make another movie. Actors are going to start to have very different roles. If you can digitally put the hair back on Bruce Willis's head, does he <laughs> commit to John McClane again? Him? He don't, you don't need him. That's the whole point. <laughs> He's just got to sign his rights off. You can actually get someone who wants to play the part. Ooh. I have, I have nothing new to add to that. I think it's that, yeah, there's going to be a growing pains period, but then, yeah, it's like section three, paragraph two, part B is going to say, from now until, you know, 50 years from now, your digital likeness will be ours. So, yeah. All right, guys, that'll do it for us for this installment of the Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, the most important part of this entire show is not what we have to say. It's what you have to say. Make sure you jump into the comments section and leave your thoughts on all the topics that we discussed here today. I want to thank the people sitting around the table with me. First of all, starting over there, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you and your crocodile? John, this weekend, me and the Gator will be in Seattle telling jokes at the Parlor next week at the Tempe Improv. And this Wednesday, the Schmoes No Live show officially moves to its new time slot. It's new day, Wednesday night, 7 and 9 p.m. 
p.m. PST. See you guys there, or else you're a square. Jeremy Johns, where can people find you carpooling? Uh, you can carpool with me at uh, the general internets on uh, YouTube and Twitter at Jeremy Johns. You can also find me on my Verizon Go 90 show, Awesome Tacular. It's movies, TV, video games. It's all in a package for you. We have a lot of fun there. Check that out. And just so that you guys know, I don't know if this is going to continue, but it looks like what they're doing right now. You can check new episodes of... Uh, Awesome Tacular with Jeremy Johns on the Verizon Go 90 Network. But you can also right now find one week old episodes of Awesome Tacular on the Go 90 YouTube channel. So if you yes. want to go check out some of the other episodes, I believe there are three episodes of Awesome Tacular up right now on the Verizon Go 90 YouTube cha channel. Go and check that out. And actually, can we get links to those put into the description of the video? So after the live stream is done, you can look in the description of this video. You'll find links to both the Go 90 current show. And, of course, the ones that are running on One Week Delay on the YouTube channel. Christian, where can people find you? Well, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram uh, at Christian Harloff. But some Schmodown news, the season premiere, it happens this Friday. Make sure you check it out. Bibiani, JTE. Heroes and Superhero News is happening as well on Heroes Today. There's a special announcement about that match. So Ooh. make sure you check out Heroes Today. Find out the announcement of what's happening between Heroes and Superhero News. Of course, over at, I guess what I'm dubbing the communications table right now, we got Ashley Mova. Ashley, now, have you, first of all, have you found that video of Channing Tatum? And then where can people find you online? I'm going to be saving that one for later, if you know what I mean. Whoa. Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, <laughs> Ashley Mova. Happy Tuesday, yeah, girl. <laughs> Wendy Lee, where can people find you? You can find me on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, at Wendy Lee Zaney. And by the way, Wendy, great job yesterday on Movie Talk with me. Thanks for doing that. Thanks, it was fun. And of course, you guys can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter, simply at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. Share this video around on your social media, and we'll check you again tomorrow. And until then, bye-bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.